What's up, Random Phantom? How's it going? Hope you guys are doing well. Um, today we're about to get into the latest breakdown from New Rockstars. This time for the Suicide Squad, which I absolutely adored and loved. Um, so let's get into the uh, reaction and we'll have my more official thoughts afterwards and probably throughout as uh, the video progresses. So let's go. <laughs> To New Rock Stars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of James Gunn's Suicide Squad. A thrilling bloodbath on an island of broken toys. From the gory visual details to the music to the DC Easter eggs and cameos, I'm going to break down this film scene by scene to appreciate the deeper reasons why this movie feels like such a redemption. And to celebrate the Suicide Squad, we have oh, yeah. some new merch. Our latest obsession, Bad Company Design. We also got this awesome King Shark shirt, which is, of course, an homage to that classic Jaws poster. Mm -hmm. nom, nom, nom. We've got a whole bunch of different colors for these and a brand new nerdy streetwear hoodie and more stuff on the way. So check out these Suicide Squad exclusives at NewRockStarsMerch.com. Bird. So opens on Savant, a lesser known DC villain played here by Michael Rooker, who worked alongside James Gunn and the Guardians of the Galaxy movies along with Sean Gunn and Sylvester Stallone, who voices King Shark. Here, Gunn frames Savant reflected in a grimy puddle at first, which is similar to the murky water he ends up bleeding out into. The I will say that was a really cool shot. The way they did that, pulled out and turned the camera. Oh my gosh. I will say that was probably one of the best shots in a movie of 2021 so far. That was a great shot. Music we hear is Folsom Prison Blues, Johnny Cash's anthem for the incarcerated, giving some hope for redemption and others accepting that they are beyond it, much like the characters of this film. And such is the case for Savant here, who cruelly kills a bird. Trigger warning here if you love birds like I do. Oh. <laughs> Notice how right on the moment of death, the music shifts from stereo in the mix of the movie to diegetic in the scene. So we're leaving Savant's escapist fantasy of freedom, symbolized by the bird, to death in captivity, just like how Savant will die a prisoner. The doctor who implants the detonator chip is played by John Ostrander, writer of the Suicide Squad comic that Gunn wanted to be oh, that's cool. of with this that's cool. really the reason why this movie can exist. Rick Flagg returns from the 2016 Suicide Squad, which this movie is kind of a soft read. Boot up. We're bringing back Rick Flagg, Harley Quinn, Amanda Waller, and Captain Boomerang, but no one else. However, this movie doesn't erase anything that happened in the DC films prior, and I would argue celebrates the best parts of those movies. So joining hmm. Flagg's group is Boomerang, as well as TDK, an adaptation of the one joke character Arm Fall Off Boy, Javelin, Arm Fall Off Boy, Mongal, an alien warrior and daughter to Superman villain Mongol, Blackguard, aka Richard or Dick Hertz, who's a villain to Booster Gold, and Weasel. Played by Sean Gunn in motion capture, Weasel's bright blue eyes are going to be distorted and skewed versions of Sean Gunn's baby blues. And of course, Harley Quinn. Go back in prison house. No road rage. Now, the 2016 film oh, Leto Joker freeing Harley from prison, but Birds of Prey established that they had broken up. And notice how her jacket now reads, Live Fast, Die Clown, replacing her jacket in the 2016 film that read Property of the Joker, just a cool way of reflecting her new independence from him. Similarly, her shoulder tattoo that previously read Property of the Joker now reads Property of No One. The ah, Ranch, interesting. Vigilantism, kidnapping, extortion, destruction of property, attempted homicide, and production of illegal weapons, Mongal's Lister as alien, endless mass homicide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, destruction of property, aiding and abetting, and threatening an official. And I love how all of Waller's aides take bets on who's going to die first, just like we all did the first time we saw the cast list. Javelin, <laughs> what's DK's name? The name is Letters? All lines of letters, DK. Similar joke to the one in Infinity War. That's a made-up word. What was made-up? Which was a line written by Taika Waititi for that film, the same guy who later delivers the core theme of this film as the original rat catcher. Harley loves Jackson's <laughs> German accent. American women all love accents. We do. Because we don't got none. <laughs> Margaret Robbie is, of course, Australian. She is doing a heavy Brooklyn accent as Harley here. Now, Weasel seems to drown. The Weasel is dead! I repeat, the Weasel is dead! Yeah, notice how on Economos' screen, he only now marks Weasel in red, based in on Savant's call, not when he actually would have expired moments earlier in the water. This explains how they considered this character dead, despite his later survival in the first huh. scene. And, by the way, in that moment, he rises under a full moon, calling back Blackguard's misplaced fear that he was a werewolf. Parkour 
short screen makes it seem like Judy King's attack is going to be epic and clear the beach like Yondu's Yaka Arrow, but instead they just slowly inch their way in normal human walking speed up the beach to just pester the soldiers. Yeah, this is the moment that the tide really turns in this battle and they start dying off one by one, and Flag and Harley realize that their group was set up to be a diversion so that the other group could take the lead in the mission. Savant's head forms the title, a trick that James Gunn uses throughout this film, kind of a visual equivalent of making music diegetic, making something that normally is cinematically expository, instead coming from within the scene. And of course, Team that was so cool. Sport, Peacemaker, Red Catcher 2, King Shark, and Polka Dot Man, all villains or anti-heroes of ranging notoriety in the DC world. On Economos' screen, TDK is listed in critical condition, so not dead yet. And on Savant's corpse, another yellow bird shows up, avenging the one he killed. The Waller blackmails mm -hmm. the sport with his daughter's legal troubles. Yeah, he thought she said star latch. Ironically, that is what he has to face by the end of the movie, a latching star or fish. Let's support Peacemaker bicker over hitting a target more centered than the other. I got smaller bullets. What? They go inside your bullet holes without even touching the side. This is exactly what <laughs> Peacemaker in their final duel. King Shark reads his book, This is the Varieties of Religious Experience by William James, a psychological study that looks at commonalities in different religions across traditions. Nice. King Shark's original name in this movie, Nananue, and Waller says that people believe he was the descendant of an ancient shark god. Maybe Nananue was given this book to see if there is any cross-cultural validity to his divinity. But then again, he doesn't know what he's reading. He's reading it upside down. They pass this email. <laughs> this is actually kaleidoscopes. Confirmed in the movie's credits, this is a villain to Superboy in the DC comics. Redcatcher 2 has a photo of her father in the cell. So Taika was actually with us in this movie since the beginning. She's always sleeping in this movie, which is a fun character quirk. But she later says... Was having the most wonderful dream. I like to think she could be dreaming about her old man, and then she sleeps all the time in order to keep him fresh in her memory. Tom hmm. Gunn also cameos as Calendar Man, a DC villain arguably best known for his Hannibal Lecter style role in Batman The Long Halloween. To the right of him is this guy with the ace tattoo. This is Double Down, a villain to the Flash. His face is scarred because a mysteriously cursed deck of cards scarred his skin, allowing him to detach the cards from his body and then use them to slice people. Porto Maltese is an island huh. issue in the DC world that appears in The Dark Knight Returns, a place Superman is sent on a mission and then the USSR nukes it. But this place also showed up in Tim Burton's Batman. It's a place Vicki Vale went on assignment. The name of the fortress is Jotunheim, which in Norse mythology is the home of the giants and the frost giants. You'll know it for the Marvel world as home realm of Loki. But in the DC comics, it is a fortress that was built by Nazis but in a different country of Karak. Correct. Country, and Jotunheim was destroyed by Rick Flagg in the first Suicide Squad mission. Waller explains how a military coup executed the whole ruling Herrera family. And you can notice how behind the father's hanging body, you can see the feet of a toppled statue that probably would have been his grandfather or great-grandfather destroyed when this coup took place. As Bloodsport's team hikes through the jungle, the framing initially hides Polka Dot Man mostly behind an alleyway in order to delay the reveal of his glowing rash. But you do see him glowing <laughs> very briefly, very suddenly on the beach at the start of the hike. But then, of course, later, when he gets engorged with them and he has to vomit them out, the few that float away burn the nearby plants. Just a little tease of how incendiary these things are when they're used. Waller orders Bloodsport <laughs> to rescue Rick Flag. Rick Flag. I know. You both served on special forces in Karak that took down Avril Kadam. Again, Karak, that fictional DC country. And Avril Kadam is a general who overtook the country in some Deathstroke comics. And I'm just going to say, you have to be a seriously nerdy person. <laughs> get all these uh and sometimes i wish i was nerdy enough to get myself into the comics because there's so much lore to them especially with me being a big spider-man fan that whole thing is just <laughs> like there's so much even more lore to spider-man than i even know it's like when i learn about it it's just like through the movies and whatever it's kind of sad though but oh uh, man like these guys are just fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting here in the scene. A few crow people were left visible in the background. Whoopsie. So they raid the camp and they slaughter friendly militants. Polka Dot Man collapses the watchtower and knows that one of the dots burns a hole through the guy's chest and Peacemaker's pacifist dove icon is appropriately stained with the blood of his victims. We see some archive footage of astronauts with Starro. Starro is a longtime DC 
parasitic hive mind who has plagued the Justice League. Actually, a mechanized version of Starro showed up in the Snyder Cut. Oh, like interesting. Like pose pretending to smoke, and they give these thumbs up. They're evoking the infamous Abu Ghraib prison torture photos. In the footage, after feeding on the consciousnesses of three hosts, Starro has grown noticeably larger, explaining its gigantic size after latching onto thousands of Porto Maltesians. Luna courts Harley Quinn in a kind of Evita scenario, but really as a further F you to the United States. But notice how this romantic montage switches suddenly from the surreal back to the real. Again, the switch to diegetic music reflects the return to reality. Harley ends up killing Luna out of a promise to herself to kill any boyfriend who gave off red flags, referencing her growth from her past toxic relationship with the Joker. Polka Dot Man explains how his dots are an interdimensional virus. My mother was a scientist at Star Labs, so she was obsessed with turning me and my brothers and sisters into superheroes. Star Labs, of course, the recurring facility in the DC where Cyborg's father Silas Stone works and shows up in the Flash a lot, and he reveals that he sees his mother everywhere. My favorite shot of the film, especially with the mom version of the shark pawing at the butterfly, but also look at that. Sebastian the Rat is also turning the mother. He's wearing the mother's glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> translates to obstacles are opportunities, which you might interpret as a nod to James Gunn turning his temporary firing from Disney into this wonderful opportunity to revitalize the DCEU. Waller references playing golf with Senator Cray, a nod to Senator Joseph Cray from Ostrander Suicide Squad, who sold government contracts. And when Economist asks her if she'd really harm Bloodsport's daughter, she says, I don't know half of what I ever did, John. Maybe referring to the 2016 film when she offs pretty much all of her aides, making this a kind of threat to him. Cleo and Bloodsport share some memories of their fathers. I didn't finish a task where I usually dole out the punishment. Yeah, notice how Peacemaker smirks here. Waller did say that both of them were trained from a young age to be killers by their dads, and the Peacemaker spinoff series that the second post credit scene sets up will feature Robert Patrick as his father on. Oh, the I know that. Interesting. And as Peacemaker enters, he bumps into this old man. This is a cameo by director Lloyd Kaufman, James Gunn's mentor from his days at Troma Studios. Oh, Kaufman interesting. Okay. As a killed prisoner in Guardians of the Galaxy. And dancing on stage in red is a cameo by Tom Clemente, who plays Mantis in the end. You. Really? The dancers around him as his mother, and I love how they keep the blue shifted beard on the one on the left. And major props, by the way, to actress Lynn Ash for selling 11 distinct versions of the dancing mom. Now, Bloodsport surrenders himself in flag and Peacemaker over to the authorities, knowing from his and Flag's shared combat experience and Peacemaker's similar upbringing that the three of them probably all know the Death's Touch maneuver. Then, as they drive in to save Harley, Bloodsport makes fun of Peacemaker's helmet, calling it a toilet seat. It's not a toilet seat. It's a beacon of freedom. Remember when we. <laughs> he was cleaning the prison toilet seat, so really he was dissing Peacemaker's shiny helmet while complimenting his own skills at scrubbing something so good until it's that shiny. The guy torturing Harley Quinn responds to the text reading, what are you doing with emojis indicating he is electrocuting a woman in a red dress, which brings him joy. Now the music that plays over Harley's escape is a mix of Justin Gigolo and I Ain't Got Nobody, the song that she was singing before, so now that it's playing in the audio mix, we're back in Harley's subjective point of view, so all of her kills are seen as super stylized with all this surrealism taking the form of flowers and animated creatures similar to how she would envision herself as Marilyn Monroe in Birds of Prey and you can see some cartoon rabbits spinning around her and the birds that were following her are now a little scared of her they hide behind the pillar as she exits even outside in the camera, mm -hmm. the animation continues out of focus in the hallway back inside so they brief the thinker we found this and we find out any information you give us is false we die we find out you have personalized license plates you die what? Remember, Mr. J had personalized plates, so another example of how Harley hates anything associated with him. They make it into the Jotunheim Tower, and you see German words line the walls. You see, Die Karte der Butun, or the Map of Reason. And then later, at another angle, Die Taten alle Menschen, or the Actions of All Humanity. I'm not certain, mm. but since this tower was built by the Nazis, I'm assuming this is part of some sweeping progress-focused justification of their cruel human experimentation. And they find the horror show below with all these Starro drones and test subjects, and the thinker reveals that this was an American-funded operation. And now, when we see the NASA astronauts, the red, white, and blue of the flag patch is more saturated than it was in the footage before, recalling the huge flag in the opening minutes of this movie, reframing the whole mission as one to preserve America. 
flag and peacemakers mm -hmm. fight over whether to release the hard drive to the public and the press. And Gunn shoots his fight in the reflection of the helmet. I love this shot because somehow they've kept the camera from appearing in the reflection, which is probably a mix of camera blocking, but also the helmet design, the way it was curved, also probably a bit of VFX in there. Milton dies. Oh. And Bloodsport and Harley tragically barely remember him as being part of the crew, which is super messed up because he just held the door open behind him for Harley to follow. The charges blow early, nah. and when <laughs> Dunaway's new friends attack him, bloody water gushes up, which is just like how it looked when the Great White was the attacker in the movie Jaws. And down below, he attacks the soldiers, biting off one's head, and is later seen gnawing the rest of the flesh off his skull. Bloodsport Aristocats down the floors of the collapsing tower to, nah. to save Cleo with smaller bullets. Now, giant Starro's rise from the debris is nuts, but I love how Gunn leans into the insanity with the Scott Pilgrim-style title text. Starro and all of its hosts scream at them, just like the scream in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And Bloodsport finally steps up as a leader, as Amanda Waller promised she would turn him into, but actually, in this case, in spite of what Waller wants him to do in this moment, he helps Polka Dot Man see Starro as his mom is him to burn off one of its legs to immobilize it, but he dies a superhero, just like how back in the briefing room he said he wanted to die on this mission. Bloodsport fights through the infected, and he pulls off pieces of his armor bit by bit to turn them into weapons until he runs out. A cool way of reflecting his character stripping away his armor to become more vulnerable. Cleo mm -hmm. weakens thousands of rats with composer John Murphy's amazing track called Ratsism, as this also becomes a baptism for Bloodsport as the rats wash over him. And the music uses a children's choir, giving these rats a deeper humanity. Harley uses Javelin's Javelin to spear Starro's eye, but really it's the rats who bring it down by gnawing at the nerve tissue. Though really, Starro's final words are pretty tragic. I was happy, floating, staring at the stars. Just a reminder that even Starro was once a lowly, innocent creature who was dragged into this fight by the real enemy. <laughs> uncaring government interests. The final shot recalls James Gunn's shot of Drax in the closing moments of Guardians of the Galaxy when Drax pet Rocket to console him. But whereas that moment was about Rocket finally allowing someone else to connect with him, this is about the broken loner allowing himself to show compassion. I went deeper into this closing imagery and the post credit scenes in a whole other video. Go check that out. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Boss. Follow and subscribe to New Rockstars. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Man, I gotta say, like, it's weird to say that King Shark and Polka Dot Man were like the two standouts of the Suicide Squad. Man, I gotta say, that was... <laughs> especially King Shark. King Shark was hilarious. I love how uh, Polka Dot Man like, uh, did with all his like mother and whatever. That was that was uh, pretty great. I will say, Weasel, Weasel just <laughs> felt like... I know it was for a joke, but it was just like, felt like, what were you doing about that post credit scene was hilarious. Um, and I will say, James Gunn is a fantastic director. There's like, all those shots that he did, the one towards the beginning, that helmet scene and with the fight and whatever, that was pretty fantastic. But yeah, all in all, <laughs> it's a pretty good movie, and this was a fantastic breakdown. So I just want to say to those who are new here, if you made it to the end of the video, I really appreciate it. Um, you can go ahead and check out my channel for other reactions like this, trailer reactions, top tens, and a bunch of other film-related content. And if you are a returning subscriber, I seriously appreciate you. If you are new to subscribing, don't forget to click the bell to get notified of future videos. Um, I just want to say, if you would like to support me, I have a Patreon where you can uh, get early access to videos and all that kind of stuff. I have a Twitter where you can follow me. I give uh, updates to the vids and uh, my favorite movie news and I talk about all that kind of stuff. I have a Discord where you can join to uh, interact with me and a bunch of other people. So I just want to say one last time, I appreciate you all. Stay random. <laughs>